All right, what is going on, guys? This is the long-awaited Oppenheimer somewhat in-depth review. Um, I'm very excited for this, but also very nervous because I have to get through a lot while keeping it short and to the point, but um, I'm excited for this, and yeah, let's let's get into it. When it comes to this movie Oppenheimer, I um, after seeing it, I, I, I thought of it as sort of like a cautionary tale, as you see from the title and from the thumbnail. I mean, it's a cautionary tale of of being careful for what you asked for in sort of a way, you know? Oppenheimer, in the context of what he had to do in the time period that he was in, he was very excited to create this atomic bomb and, um, and enthusiastic about it in a way, but afterwards he was very, very, um, regretful in a way. I mean, because he knew the power that he had unleashed and he pretty much let the genie out of the bottle and he wanted to put the genie back in the bottle, but his country despised him for it they despised him for wanting to 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 um to control these um weapons of mass destruction but that's that's uh sort of my shortened version of of what i i think the whole movie what i got out of the movie basically but um to go a bit more in depth i want to talk about uh some of my favorite characters in the movie like um like oppenheimer like uh lewis strauss to start off with Oppenheimer, Killian Murphy's character, I thought Killian Murphy played him amazingly. There was so much, so much beauty in his performance and the in in, in, in a lot of the intimate moments that we got with him. And a lot of that you have to uh, credit to um, Christopher Nolan for the beautiful camera work that he made. Um, he was so so easily able to 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 make the intimate moments seem so so close and uh, and and uh, sentimental, but at the same time, uh, he was also able to make the grand bombastic moments so so amazing too and spectacular. And I mean, he they did it masterfully. I think Christopher Nolan was able to play the character of a man that was regretful for for the things that he did, but at the same time, he he knew what he did and he knew that he couldn't change it, and he had to live with. The consequences of what he created and moving on from Killian Murphy's character Oppenheimer the main guy uh, of the movie I want to touch on Louis Strauss which was probably my favorite if not probably my second favorite character of the movie uh, behind Oppenheimer um, I mean Robert Downey Jr. what a performance I think he will easily easily win best supporting uh, uh, character for the Oscars I, I think Ah oh, man, it's such a different role than what we're used to seeing from RDJ, and he played it so so amazingly. I mean, what a performance from RDJ! He played such a such a such an amazing performance. Seeing him play a uh, character that is as conniving and and vindictive and uh, and vengeful like Louis Strauss was just something so different, and he played it so masterfully. Uh, like you got lost in in Louis Strauss and in, in RDJ's character. Sometimes you didn't even realize you're, that you were looking at Robert Downey Jr. You were invested and you believed it. You know what I mean? You didn't get like you know when I first heard that RDJ was gonna be in this movie, I thought ah throughout the movie I'm probably gonna probably gonna be taken out of him. Be like oh it's it's Iron Man, you know? But um, but no, I I, I was so invested and I never got taken out of it. There's so much I can say about Louis Strauss, but I I I loved his character. And, the, and his um, dynamic with um, Oppenheimer and even like other characters like Albert Einstein, he felt like this character that wanted to fit in so bad with people like Oppenheimer and Albert Einstein, but just wasn't like them. He he was he was anything like them, and he just didn't fit in. And um, he got humiliated for it, and he and he was very vengeful because of it. Um, so yeah, uh, that, that that's all I'm gonna touch on. I don't like I said I want to ramble too much because I also want to get into the into the story of the movie, but um. But I'm gonna touch on two other characters that I really loved, um, uh, and that is um, Emily Blunt's character, uh, Kitty Oppenheimer. She portrayed so many emotions in this movie, and just and just portrayed them so accurately. There was moments where she was happy, there was moments where she was sad and angry, and each time I was fully invested and fully believed what I was watching that was happening in current time. It's just the way she played it was so amazing. I I, I loved her character in the in, in the um in the trial scenes. One of my favorite scenes with her is when she's in the trial and um she gets um she talks to the people that are um basically interrogating Oppenheimer, questioning him, and um and she um she sort of plays like a smart ass. She 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 fires back at them because she can't stand the fact that they're disrespecting their husband so so badly. So he she turns it on them and uh, and acts the same way that they're acting towards them. And she also um holds a grudge against a lot of these people, especially Edward Teller, who's another one of my favorite characters. 
of the of the story, but I won't touch on him because he's not ad, as important. But I love the actor that played Edward Teller and the character of Edward Teller in this movie Oppenheimer. I mean, when you see when you see Emily Blunt's character Kitty Oppenheimer and Edward Teller uh, near the end of the movie when Oppenheimer gets rewarded with that medal and she doesn't shake his hand, it's just like you just feel the envy in her. And you feel all the emotions in there. To move on to the other character that I was talking about, Jean Tacklock, she is just the way Florence Pugh plays her. It's just a rocket ship of emotions. The real life Jean Tatlock was sort of similar. She just was a very, a very confusing woman, to be honest. Like there was moments where you don't know if she's in love with Oppenheimer or if she hates him or if she doesn't want to see him or if she, or if she does want to see him. And she plays it so well. And um, and yeah, it, it was a fun character. A lot of a lot of um different different um aspects of her that we got to see and um and we also got to see how the character of gene tatlock came back and also came back and bit oppenheimer in the butt man because these connections he had with these communists didn't really help him and he and he he agreed with a lot of the ideals of communism and had a lot of friends that were in the communist party and it just didn't help him out when it came to the government and moving on to the uh to the story aspect now um, the the whole movie starts off with the um, with the myth of Prometheus, a titan who stole the fire from the gods and gave it to humanity. And obviously, if you know anything about this myth, it, it ascended with terrible conse consequences. And um, I mean, that's that's easily um, uh, comparable to Oppenheimer and how he created this atomic weapon that um, that gave the power to the people to destroy themselves. But then we actually see. Early on, I believe um, Albert Einstein and um, and Oppenheimer had a pond talking, and this scene shows up at the beginning of the of the movie and also shows up at the end of the movie, which is something really cool. And uh, from that first scene, we can already see that Robert Downey Jr. Uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s uh, Louis Strauss isn't too fond of Oppenheimer. Uh, Oppenheimer and Albert Einstein have a conversation, and uh, which leads uh, Louis Strauss to believe that um, uh, uh, Oppenheimer is um, telling negative things about Louis Strauss to Albert Einstein, and that immediately, immediately sets sets things off. Not to mention, in the future, Oppenheimer will hum humiliate uh, Louis Strauss at a at a in a public setting, which even furthers his envy for him. And um, and yeah, and after that, we just see a rundown of um, of uh, Oppenheimer's early life, him him studying, uh, almost poisoning his teacher, which is honestly funny. We get to see Niels Bohr. That's one thing I loved. We got to meet a lot of a lot of um, cool historical f figures like like Edward Teller, like Niels Bohr, like Heisenberg, like uh, Feynman. You know what I mean? Albert Einstein, just amazing characters throughout history. John F. Kennedy, even though he's not a scientist, but you know, just a lot of famous people throughout history. After he's done studying abroad and all that, he brings quantum physics to the United States and um, makes his own school. And at first he has a bit of trouble, you know, finding students, but over time he, he gets a lot of his students in. And throughout this point, he's still, um, he's still supporting a lot of communist ideals, has a lot of communist connections. Uh, throughout this time, he meets Ernest Lawrence, who's one of his friends. And uh, Ernest gets mad at him a lot of the times because he keeps bringing in his politics into the laboratory and he does not like that whatsoever. Um, also, throughout this time, obviously we meet Gene Tatlock early on at a uh, fundraiser, I believe it was, and um, immediately we get um, a sex scene between the two, which is very, uh, <laughs> very interesting. And he actually, throughout the, during this scene, he recites his famous line, the, um, I am now become death, the destroyer of worlds. Because of these communist connections like Gene Tatlock, like all of these people, um, it is hard for the government to really involve uh, Oppenheimer early on into the Manhattan Project until finally he cuts off a lot of these people. Um, he cuts off Jean Tatlock, he doesn't talk to her for a while, and then, although he does tell her that he'll always be there for her, and then he meets Kitty Oppenheimer, and then they start a relationship. She used to be a communist too, but then left, so after she left after Oppenheimer started getting involved into all this government uh, stuff, and then eventually they do let him on, um, Specifically, uh, General Groves um, uh, invites Oppenheimer on onto the Manhattan Project, um, and yeah, I mean they have a, a pretty good uh, a pretty good relationship. Uh, General Groves and Oppenheimer they have respect for each other, and um, and yeah, Oppenheimer's off, and he gathers the best scientists in um, <laughs> in America, and they create this atomic bomb uh, using plutonium and uh, and uranium. But before that, before he's on the Manhattan Project, um, he releases his paper on black holes, but um, that is overshadowed, obviously, by the invasion of Poland by Nazi Germany. Now, 
they're in a race basically with the Nazis to create the atomic bomb because it was made known when you bombard a uranium nucleus with neutrons, the nucleus can be split, um, releasing a lot of energy, which leads to a chain reaction, obviously. And um, and so this is known, this is figured out, and now they're in a race against the Nazis to build the bomb. Eventually, the Nazis, obviously, they um, they surrender, they get beaten, so now... This sort of adds in this question of is it really is it so worth it to create this thing to to destroy thousands of people's lives in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which is the places that they chose? Uh, is it still worth it to bomb Japan? I mean, Germany surrendered, so what's the point? And um, but now that the Nazis are out of it, I mean, a lot of people question what what what's the point of, of building this, you know? But they build it either way, um, and the, this leads to the first Trinity test um in los alamos and um and i mean the way they shot the the first trinity test was just amazing i mean the suspense in the score was just incredible i mean you had the violins going and it was all building up building up and you finally get to see it you finally get to see the atomic implosion and it's just it's breathtaking like you don't know what to say you're speechless during it and it's just it, it's incredible man i mean uh, christopher nolan wrote it beautifully and there's so many small little details in it like um for instance when Feynman and um and all them and edward teller all the scientists were watching the explosion Feynman wrote a book about his time there in los alamos and he wrote about how when the test was happening, he was in, he was like inside of a car, I believe, behind glass, and they offered him like a welder's glasses so that um, it didn't blind him. He knew that the glass would stop the UV rays, so he didn't take the glasses. And that's a little like detail that Christopher Nolan put into there that I thought was really cool to see that because that's just like a, a really small little detail. And yeah, no, it was true. Feynman rejected the glasses because he knew that the UV rays wouldn't pass through the the glass and then Oppenheimer during his time in Los Alamos Jean Tatlock actually passed away um some say that she killed herself drowned herself some others say maybe there was foul play um they bring that up um I don't know I I think I think the more probable cause is that she committed suicide she was a very depressed person a lot of the times and um, Oppenheimer was never fully by her side but um so I, I think she probably committed suicide sadly but that's that I mean and yeah, after the Trinity test, they create Fat Man and Little Boy, and then they go on to um, to drop the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And, um, and yeah, I mean, they, they play it through the radio. Oppenheimer knows what happens, and he's very, he feels very conflicted. He's happy that he, he completed his task. At the same time, he feels very conflicted in, in the fact that he created these weapons, and you can see how conflicted he is when he gives his speech in Los Alamos. Um, that speech where he's like, the world will remember this day, and all that. So, And then he ends up meeting Trinity. Truman, they have a they have a little sit down. Oppenheimer tells him he feels like he has blood on his hands. Tru Truman calls him a crybaby scientist and all that. That's also very famous. And then uh, the trials happen. The trials mainly happen because um, Strauss really um really fucked him over. I mean, he pretty much set the dogs on him. And uh, especially after Oppenheimer was such so against the creation of the hydrogen bomb, which Edward Teller actually created the hydrogen bomb and stayed in Los Alamos to work on it. He was against it. He didn't want any more weapons of mass destruction to get to be created. He wanted the U.S. to have um, uh, to talk with Russia so that there wouldn't be an arms race. And he was denied all of this. And his security clearance was eventually after it expired. He tried to renew it, I believe. And that's when the trials happened. And um, yeah, he got ripped to shreds, to be honest. And it was very unfair. Um, a lot of people stood up, st uh, stuck up for him. A lot of scientists, a lot of his friends, General Groves stood up for him as best as he could his wife a lot of scientists like i said the people that were really against him were edward teller and um and strauss and i mean they they didn't need much to really find him um guilty of being uh of turning his back on his country i mean they thought he was um they thought that he was giving information to the soviets and uh, they had evidence and they used any evidence they could to just prove themselves right and um they used his connections with gene tatlock who was a communist they used his connections with his own brother frank who was also part of the communist party and how he invited him to Los Alamos. They used his own wife, who used to be part of the Communist Party, and they used Edward Teller to speak against him. And that's when we had the whole scene when Edward uh, tries to shake his hand, and obviously Oppenheimer does, because Oppenheimer seems like the type of guy that doesn't really hold any grudges, you know? He just... He, he tries to do what's best, and um, if people don't agree with him, then it is what it is. He's not very much so of a confrontational person, per se, but that's who Oppenheimer is. They deny his um, his renewal for his um, for his security clearance, and yeah, the country turns on him. He loses his fame. Yeah, and, and it'll be many years later till um, he gets recognized for what he did. Louis Strauss um, is also sort of in a similar situation, where he's um, in front of a bunch of... Um, 
senators, I believe it was, for him for him to be promoted to a higher position in in the government, and um and a bunch of scientists uh, are against him being promoted in any way because they bring up his his vengeful and his vindictive acts against Oppenheimer. And um, and that pretty much was the nail in the coffin for him not getting uh, what he wanted and, and being promoted. So his uh, vengeful acts against Oppenheimer really came back to bite him in the ass, too. So and the movie ends with the um, with Oppenheimer's visions of, uh, of nuclear warfare destroying the world yeah, and the skies being lit up with nuclear implosions. And now that I gave a basic rundown of the whole movie, I want to touch on some of the scenes that I really enjoyed. Some of the things that I liked, some of the creative uh, liberties that uh, Christopher Nolan took. Um, first being the um, the nonlinear structure of the movie. It's it flows in and out through time, and that's what I love. It's very, it's not stale. It, uh, it flows in and out at a time. We go from the present to the future to the past seamlessly, and I love that because um, it's different. Not not a lot of people do that. Um, they all follow your, a lot of movies nowadays follow very linear structures. You know what I mean? And uh, I also love the, um, the 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 different changes between subjective point of views using uh, color and non-color and black and white. We go from Oppenheimer's subjective point of view uh, with color and everything we see is through his eyes and then we switch to black and white whenever we're in Louis Strauss's point of view or in other people's point of views and I love that. Um, I, I love the scene and I touched on this on my last review when, um, when Oppenheimer and General Groves are talking about the possibilities of them destroying the world if they press a button. It's that when we push that button, we destroy the world. Chances are near zero. Near zero. What do you want from theory alone? Zero would be nice. Because that was a real uh, um, probability. That was a real I issue that a lot of scientists had. Like if if they set off this tra chain reaction, there's a probability that they could not stop this chain reaction and they would set the atmosphere on fire and it would just destroy the world. And that was just crazy because at the end of the day, this movie is one of the most tells one of the most dramatic stories to ever happen in human history and honestly it has one of the most important human beings in it with Oppenheimer the father of the atomic bomb the father of this new age that we live in and we live still in, live in the shadow of that and um and yeah it just the stakes were so high and those are my favorite scenes I also want to talk about um one of the main uh things that are said every time and that is um throughout the movie and that's uh theory will only take you so far and i love this quote because it applies to so many things not just uh not just to what's happening in the movie in the context of the movie but it also in real life like theory could only take you so far at some point you got to go past theory and really get out there and and you know get your hands dirty i think at the end of the day this movie is 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 a real tragedy it's um <laughs> Uh, mainly for Oppenheimer and also just in general to be fair because Oppenheimer did everything he could for his country and then his country turned his back on him and that's that's just a real tragedy and also he he opened up a bottle and the genie came out and that genie is obviously a nuclear warfare I mean if you look at now modern day with Russia and Ukraine and all that stuff and um and the Cold War and the arms race there was a lot a lot of time after what happened with Oppenheimer um, throughout history, there was just a fear of nuclear destruction and there still is. And that's, that's, that's Oppenheimer's fault. And I mean, it's hard to blame him. Cause like I said, at the context of what he had to do and the time period that he was in, it's hard to blame him, man. It really is. He was just doing his job. And I think that's, that's pretty much all I want to say. I, I think I just want to say one last thing. And that's the, um, during the Trinity test in the movie, um, the line, the famous line, uh, I am now become death, the destroyer of worlds is said. And when that, when he said that, I got goosebumps. I mean, what a scene. What a movie, man. I, I hope I touched on, on I tried to I tried to do my best to touch on everything. This video is, so far the recording is 30 minutes long, so I have to cut, cut out a lot. Because I don't want it to be this long. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I hope you guys enjoyed. And uh, I'll catch you in the next one. The next video will be... A Barbenheimer video talking about reviewing Barbenheimer, basically reviewing both movies, comparing and contrasting. So, so yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll catch you in the next one. See ya. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that. <laughs>